so many reasons, Steve. <laughs> So thank you very much, uh, Jelena and Nikos, and uh, everyone who's uh, organised this today. We're just going to, Lindsay and I, are going to take a little trip through this uh, topic with you. Why, uh, which children with end-stage renal disease should have an arterial venous fistula, and why? Um, this is what end-stage looks like uh, in the UK. Um, if your kidneys fail, majority of people will start their life with uh, PD. A certain per percentage, 20-25% will go straight to transplantation, uh, but a significant number, 30 odd percent, will experience hemodialysis before uh, any other therapies. And this is what it looks like in the UK. Uh, life on hemodialysis uh, you have your mother there, probably single parent by now. Um, the male component has got fed up and disappeared. Um, she's injecting all her time and effort in looking after you and any other children in her life. Um, you have the dialysis nurse who's happily uh, flushing the ports and managing the child's catheter. Um, he's a bit fed up because he's not really allowed to go swimming with his friends, uh, but you know, he knows how life is at the moment. And this is not just representative of the UK, this is Europe, this is the US as well. This is what life is like for most children on hemo. So why get into this, ladies and gentlemen? As you can see, this young man doesn't look so pleased. Uh, why have an arterial venous fistula? Okay, he knows he's going to get a transplant, most of our children are, but as we've seen, they're going through this revolving door of dialysis, transplant, dialysis, likely, again, before they emerge into adolescence and then into the adult world. And as someone who works in paediatrics and adult, we need to take a very long-term view of how we're managing um, these young people and then young adults because this renal failure thing is a lifetime commitment for them and us. It ain't going away, folks. Some people, sadly, are going to rotate through that door faster than others, aren't they? And if you're unlucky enough to have some of these recurrent disease problems, you can whip round in a few weeks or months. And this young lady uh, reminds me of a case of a uh, young woman with um, FSGS who then got recurrence and now she's enjoying life with a catheter which keeps coming in and out. She keeps interrupting her plasma exchange therapy for her FSGS because the catheter doesn't work or the catheter gets infected and all the while her creatinine is tripping up and up and up and I kick myself for not giving her a delicious fistula earlier in her life because uh, I pretty much know she's going to need it after the transplant. Yes, I understand it. It's the Big Mac meal available at every <laughs> train station you happen to visit. It's quick, it's cheap, it's convenient. Every, every <laughs> everybody knows it. Um, but all that sugar, all that fat, all those calories, is it good for you in the long term? The answer is no, ladies and gentlemen. You know it and I know it. And particularly when you're a small person, you're in trouble in a very short period of time and you end up with this miserable look in the outpatient environment with these dilated veins uh, over your chest wall and if you bother to do the uh, angiographic investigations, you're left with this exceedingly depressing picture of central venous obstruction forevermore. Okay. And then you start to develop other problems. Uh, we've seen this recently, child who started coughing up their um, um, chylus fluid which is accumulating in their chest and their mediastinum due to having numerous lines. So she has venous and lymphatic 
hypertension. And then when you develop this, you're in a very serious situation. Multiple chest drains in, draining the uh, excess chyle in your chest, um, limitation of your diet, maybe parental nutrition, maybe asking the thoracic surgeons to try to ligate your lymphatic duct or do pleurodesis, you're in a miserable state. And it's avoidable. But this is a new diagnosis on me earlier this year. You can go from that chyla state to getting this, plastic bronchitis situation again, where your lymphatic and venous hypertension is so significant that the proteinaceous material continually leaks into your alveoli and you cough up these little proteinaceous squids, which are in fact the alveolus and terminal bronchi. And by this time, you're stuck on the ventilator. And it's only, uh, this is an example of the uh, patient's um, angiographic results. This is just the azygous vein coming into a, uh, the tip of the uh, SVC there. And um, the child also had complications associated with pulmonary emboli due to the presence of the catheter. And it's only heroic, repeated uh, uh, interventional radiology uh, that we managed to finally get the child off the ventilator. But by heroic, I mean dangerous techniques and consenting the child for death on the interventional radiology table. Uh, don't go there. Crat. This is something not slightly mentioned in the adult literature and now coming into the pediatric literature we've got a series um, which is catheter related atrial thrombosis where the catheter sits in the SVC or right atrial junction it's not in a static position every time you breathe your chest rises every time you move your arms your chest rises the catheter jumps up and down and sticks the endothelium of the uh, SVC or the cardiac uh, atrium and you get thrombus associated with the catheter and the damaged wall. You can show it with um, CT angiography or we've performed a surveillance scan with echo uh, cardiography of children with catheters and this is going on behind your back in our series which we're yet to publish 20% of children with these catheters will develop these crats. And some of them will end up on the post-mortem table. Uh, in our experience, about 10% once you've diagnosed it. So it's a very, very significant thing. Uh, and it's going on behind our backs at the minute. The other thing is hemodialysis is not equal. You can have it via a line or you can have it via a fistula. Uh, we know from the adult data that these are not the same. And now we know from the pediatric data uh, that the same rules apply. If you have your dialysis with a catheter, you're going to spend more time in hospital. You're going to have more infections. The quality, the adequacy of the dialysis is poorer. So why don't children have these fistulae more frequently? We know this from our experience and worldwide. Uh, we surveyed uh, the UK about this, but it's pretty much the same elsewhere. I understand the reasons. People are very conscious, just like you and I, about their body um, shape and form, and they don't want a damn fistula. Yes, I'm sympathetic, but they don't want the damn <coughs> renal failure for the rest of their life either. And if you approach people properly and you offer them um, good psychological preparation, there are ways to get around this. They're all going to get a kidney transplant. Yes, they probably are. But if you don't have a live donor in the UK, the waiting time is about a year now. And we already know that there are a number of people who are going to need more than one transplant. They're harder to transplant the second time. And there's this recurrent disease problem, which is very significant in children. Nobody wants to be needled. Yes, I understand that. And Lindsay's going to talk about some of the approaches that you can use to actually get over this. The surgeons aren't interested. 
Yeah, well, the surgeons like surgery, and I would say that surgery is about 20% of actually keeping a dialysis program going based on fistulae, but the surgery is just surgical technique, and whether we live in Serbia or <laughs> the UK, you can teach the damn surgeons these techniques, uh, but it's really a team effort to keep a, a dialysis program going, and the assessment of the patient before the surgery, the surveillance after, are also key components. And finally, the dialysis nurse he or she may not be comfortable. She understands how to manage the line and is happy with that. So they may need some competence and confidence in order to, how, in order to learn how to manage children with fistulae and their parents. We live in the real world and this is our uh, strategy approximately. We would say if you're before dialysis and there's no live donor option, come and see us in the vascular access clinic and we'll try and talk you into a fistula. If you have got a live donor option, avoid dialysis, go straight to transplantation. We see people with hemodialysis catheters, as you can tell. Again, if you have no live donor option, we'll give you a fistula. If you do have a live donor option, okay, keep the catheter and then just proceed to transplantation. Um, because it takes, in our experience, about six months to get through the assessment process, have the fistula matured, and then to become used to dialyzing through that fistula. By that time, we should have turned around your uh, live donation. This is absolutely key to working with fistulae in your dialysis program. You've got to think about preserving your veins, and James can't bear to look, I can't bear to look, because his venous potential is being killed by this well-meaning phlebotomist. Um, and we can't allow it. And you and I have to be constantly vigilant about this and invest in programs such as wristbands, uh, lanyards, DVDs, to hand over the responsibility to the child and their parents so that they can look after their veins for now and evermore. And just in case you were concerned about where to bleed them from, this is where you bleed them from, the back of the hands, either hands. And if you can't get in there, this is where you bleed them from, the feet. And for a smaller child, this is where you can bleed them from, the external jugular, um, and not in their arms, please. And then when you've had your lovely transplant, whether you're a body conscious young lady or a little troublemaker like this man, you've then retained your venous option for the future and you can train your staff to take the venous bloods after dialysis through the fistula and maintain their venous reserves for the future because you and I know they're going to need it. I'll hand over to my friend. Thank you. So I'm Lindsay. I'm the advanced nurse practitioner on Eagle Hemodialysis at Great Ormond Street. And I'm basically just going to talk to you about how do we actually practically get this to work in children. How do we get children to allow us to put needles in them three times a week? And I think one of the difficult things that we do see now on hemodialysis, we're seeing more of these children coming through the door, losing access, um, really anxious parents as well, and I can name two or three parents on the unit, on my unit at the moment, that are really anxious that they haven't really got much further access to go. So a little bit about my or our unit. We're a ten-bedded hemodialysis unit. Our numbers are slightly down at the moment. We're usually closed, but we're open at the moment. We've got 15. I've cursed myself now. We've got 15 in-centre hemodialysis patients. We've currently got nine on home hemodialysis. At our most, this time last year, we had 16 on home hemodialysis. Currently, we have got 10 children with fistulas. We have got two that are on the waiting list. Again, this time, we're slightly lower than what we were. This time last year, we were at 50% fistulae. Um, and we really do encourage self-needling within the unit and trying to get children to actually needle their own fistulas. And currently, of those 10 patients, we've got six that self-needle, or parents are needling. 
And as a team, we are very much looking at Fischler first. So one of our biggest problems with children or perceived problems is needle phobia and needle anxiety. So how do we actually get these children to needle? So one of the things that I asked the children on our unit was, what makes them scared of needles? What's their biggest concern with their fistulas? So starting at the top, what size needle are you going to use? And some thought can be put into this. There's different size needles, there's different size lengths as well. So look at your fistula and actually see, do they actually need the biggest needle? The biggest needle might give you really big blood flows, but do you actually need that huge needle to give them clearance? One of the things to look at is the length of the needle as well. And a lot of people are set on this 25 millimetre length needle. That looks absolutely huge when you come towards a child of it. And a lot of the time you could get, you could get away with a 20 millimetre, 15 millimetre length needle. So it's really worth looking into what your options are for that child. Scab picking is a really difficult thing within the unit. So we do something called buttonhole technique needling. And for those of you who might not know what, what that is, it's where we go in the same hole every single time and it kind of creates an earring hole. What you need to be able to do for that at the beginning of every session, you need to pick the scab off the hole. And that can be a really big thing for a child to actually pick that scab and quite traumatic for them. So usually we recommend they use something like Emla cream, Amitop. They try to get them to pick it themselves. I probably shouldn't say this, but if I'm really struggling, even get them to use their nails to try and pick that scab off after they've washed their hands. You've got to look at different coping strategies for each child. So most of these children have been in healthcare all their lives and they will have their own coping strategy for how they manage having needles just for general cannulation. And whether that be, I'll speak about that in a bit, but that might be music, it might be a sequence that they have to go through and it's really important that we adhere to that for them. Most of them have got past experience with needles. So again, it's breaking through some of those problems. And I very much recommend that if you've got a good place specialist, they have a person that's going to make this possible for you. There's a lot of pressure on the dialysis nurse. And the first thing we get is, will you get it in first time? So there's a huge pressure on the patient, but there's a huge pressure on the dialysis nurse to get that needle in first time. And they aren't always very forgiving if you don't get that needle in first time. So I think when you're looking at training your staff, because we are small numbers in paediatrics, you know, we've got to get staff trained on being able to do needling. I learned when I went to the adult services, I used to work up in Newcastle and I got sent to adults and that was invaluable for me to actually learn on a um, community, a much bigger community. And that made me feel much more confident when I came back to actually have to needle children. So for anyone who is, has got good links with adult units, I'd really suggest that you touch base with one of your adult colleagues to see if you can form any relationships between. Um, we've talked about knee, needle technique briefly. There's three needle techniques that you can use to needle fistulae. You can use a ladder technique, which is basically where you, you move the entrance point each session. Most kids don't like that technique. They're very focused on where they want you to go every session. Then you've got something called buttonhole, which I've already talked about, like an earring hole. One of the things that we do tend to default to is something called area puncture, where we go in a small space all the time and we move the needle hole probably about one or two millimetres. That's not ideal and you can have more problems with your fistula. But the problem again with paediatrics, we're very much led by our children as well and we've got to kind of meet them halfway. So we are very guilty of probably sometimes doing area puncture in paediatrics. Trust is a really big thing. Now when I say children aren't forgiven, if you've put that trust in you initially, then they can be forgiven. So I've we've worked with lots of children who are really needle phobic and usually manage to get the needle in, but if I can't get the needle in, they're usually quite forgiven of me and they will let me try again, but it's taken a lot of work initially with them to get to that point where they've gained that trust. And don't lie to them. If you tell them you're going to go in a place and go somewhere else, then you've lost their trust straight away. Um, children tend to like control as well. They've got so little control when they're on dialysis, but one of the things they do get control of is whereabouts you actually needle them in the first place. And this brings me back to where you end up going in a small space, because they will let you go in different areas, but it might be a millimetre, two millimetres away from where you've last gone, which isn't ideal. But again, to work with them to build trust, you've got to allow them some control. 
you need a lot of time when you're establishing a new fistula. So for some children, I know it's taken me up to two hours to get their first needle in. And you've got to be able to invest that time. And I know that's where my old adult colleagues would say they find it really difficult to move it forward. But in paediatrics, it's really, really important we give children this time. Pain, simple things, use Emla Amitop. We've got a lot of children saying, oh, I don't want it. When they've got their fistula, I make them do it. I won't needle them for the first time if they haven't used Emla or Amitop. They get very obsessed with who's doing their needles and they tend to like the same people. Again, we're small units, so we don't like children just to focus on one person to do their needles. But I do think in the early days, if you can get your experienced needlers established in access, then you can eventually start filtering through some of the less experienced staff. And of course, the fear of blows or infiltrations. It can be really painful when they blow their fistula and it becomes like quite scary. It can get quite bruised. So again, it's reassuring the children. So this probably should be my play specialist talk because it's mainly the work that she does. But we do do a lot of work around preparation and desensitization. So we work with kidney books, role play, messy play. We write step-by-step -step plans. We have coping techniques and reward charts. And this is just an example of someone's kidney book. Um, and it's a way of them documenting their journey, documenting their fears. They do a lot of work with them before they start cannulation. And the kids really report that this really helps in the preparation for um, cannulation. We do a lot, or our play specialists do a lot with role play, and actually letting them use the needles, get the needles out, look at them, needle their teddy bears. You can paint, you can paint with them, the needles. Do things, something to actually help desensitise to that needle. And their messy play, it's amazing what you can do with all these needles. Obviously they need supervised. <laughs> and you can put glitter down them as well. Patient plans is something that we do for absolutely everyone that comes through Hemo. So it's a very plan of what will happen the first time they get their needle. And the patient works on it with their play specialist. And they go through, we as staff have to adhere to it. We go through the steps every time because routine helps a child who's anxious. I'm not big on reward charts, but we do use them. Um, I think when you use a reward chart, you've got to be very clear how often you're giving a prize out or what reward you're actually giving a child. Um, we probably say once you've done your first needle, you might get a small reward, two needles, you get a small reward, but at the month point, that stops otherwise you could be going on for months and months with giving presents out for getting needles. Various children will have different coping strategies. Um, this young girl in the first picture, she had a breathing technique and actually that came through from when she was actually just having cannulas before she even got her fistula. And she would breathe, take some really deep breaths and at the point where she held her breath, that's when you're allowed to put the needle in. And that worked really well for her. Um, the girl next door, she had a sequence, and her sequence would be you'd count up to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you'd spray the cold spray four times, then you'd count down from 10, then you'd spray the cold spray again, and then you were able to go. And it sounds like a really long, drawn-out technique, but it really worked for her. And then we've done music as well. The same child, when we first started needling her, used to get needled to music, and Frozen was the song at the time. Definitely not, definitely not me. I never thought about asking Francis, so. Option. So I've talked about self-needling. So why encourage self-needling? It gives them some control back in their life. So the youngest self-needler that we've had was seven or eight years old, and she did her needles really well. And again, that was her, she wanted some control back over her life. Um, we did have a three or four year old that had we given the needle, he probably would have done it, but didn't feel quite well, quite right to let a three year old do their needles. It's less painful, they say, the children when they needle themselves. They have a reduced fear and anxiety because what they don't have is that coming in and looking on the board, who's doing my needles today? They've got control over it themselves. It's better for the fistula, it's promoting independence, and hopefully, eventually, it could maybe lead over to a home haemodialysis program. This is just a girl who did her, so this girl came on leaps and bounds, so the first time I needled her it took two hours and she bit me. And this is, she did her own needles this day. Now, she did do it closed eyes, she um, 
with a little bit of help, she closed her eyes and held her breath and stuck the needle in. But again, it worked for her. And you can see actually how proud she is. She's so proud of herself and that just instills confidence. We've talked a lot, or Francis has talked a lot, about preserving vascular access. One of our registrars did this, which we hand out to patients in our vascular access clinic. It's a respectfully object and asked to reevaluate. And that's saying just have two attempts at getting my bloods. Don't, don't, use, don't use my arms. We're currently working with Gosh Arts to see if we can take this project a little bit further and actually get patient involvement, see if we can reduce the amount of cannulation in the arms. Just a few examples, so some difficult access that we had. So patient one, he was three year old, he had 11 lines, um, two periods of time on needle, on hemo. Um, he was, so the second period of time he came back, he was eight, nine years old, and within two weeks he was self-needling on the unit. And that had a bit of a ricochet effect, so three of us on that same unit started needling within that week. This young girl I've talked about, she was severely, severely needle phobic and came with quite a past history of um, having some bad cannulations. Um, and what she needed, she needed some control and she needed time. She initially started with this music sequence, which worked. Then she changed her sequence into this one to ten cold spray. And eventually we got her home needling and actually she now self-needles herself at home. This young lad was probably our most difficult child and actually it took 18 months to establish needling on him. He's um, got behavioural issues, autistic. Um, and one of the mistakes I made was I'd said to mum, mum had said to me, you've just got to hold him down and do it. And I thought, you can't do that in paediatrics, can you? We don't hold patients down. So we worked with him and actually we made him worse. And what we did need to do was just get on and do it. And as soon as we did that and we took the line out at the same time, we managed to establish needling. And this mum needled successfully at home for about three, four years. We don't, we're not always successful. We've had children where they've been so scared we haven't been able to managed to get them needling and we've had fistula mutilation, at which point we've had to tie it off. But overall, in summary, we can use AVF successfully in children. It really is a team approach. It needs everyone on board and it needs some positivity, particularly from the nursing team. Use desensitisation techniques, individualised plans, trust and control is important and it's unit culture. We think fistula first. And I'm just going to leave you with a very brief film. We know there are two ways to have dialysis, uh, to have it with a line or to have it with a fistula. A fistula is a connection between an artery and a vein, and it's a small but delicate operation, uh, either at the wrist or at the elbow. Um, our experience shows that with a fistula, you get better quality dialysis, that is, the blood is cleaned better with the fistula. Also, that there's a much less chance of getting infection with a fistula compared to a line. Uh, and thirdly, that the fistula will actually last much longer than the line and have fewer problems once it's running nicely. One of the problems with being a dialysis patient is that lots of people want to take blood from you the whole time to look at your blood chemistry. And it's very, very important that the child and their parent understands that the veins in their arms, both at the wrist and at the elbow, must be protected from people taking blood from them. There's no specific age that you have to be to have a fistula. Uh, our experience tells us that if you're 10 kilos or above, then you can be suitable to have a fistula depending on the quality of your veins. Basically, what we have to do is clean it, wash it over there by the sink, and then we come here and we have these crackers that we crack and um, we wipe it on our dots where the needles go in. And then if you have scabs, you pick it and then you clean it again and then you have this thing called a tourniquet. Um, and then we put it around our arm to make our vein, the vein inside, well, vein and artery inside, um, pop come to the surface and then we put it in. 
When the nurses usually do it, I feel it hurts more. But when I put the needle in myself, I can feel where it's going so it don't hurt. My play specialist Lindsay helps me and tells me what to do. Lindsay was showing me how to self-needle with the toys, getting all the equipment and uh, doing it on the toy as if I was doing it on myself to get me ready and to help me understand how to do it properly. It's very helpful because if you start on something that you can learn on easily and uh, it's not Gonna, like you're not doing it on yourself then you're going to get more confident so it brings up your confidence to help you start doing it on your own arm. I see all the little children doing it and I just think that if they can do it I can do it. I can be brave as them. It takes time to build up that trust in a parent to suddenly become a nurse or you know putting needles in her arm but that happened very quickly and that was one of the most valuable things that was given to us that it's something that gets formed between you know parent and child so there's a different level of trust. When you first hear about fistula it is it is scary like as a parent you think this is like if this is a big thing but it's not as scary as what it seems to be. The more you do it it just becomes so easy because you now you just know how to do it. Like it's so straightforward. You're not scared. You're not. When you first start, you know, like you're all jittery and you want to make sure everything's right. And now it just becomes like second nature. You just you just do it. You just know it like that. If you're something he needs to have and it, it's going to make his life better, it's going to make our life better. Then it's just something we've got to do. Fishing lot is better than the line because I can go swimming and I can do more activities at school. With the Lyme, she has to get an infection every other day. And with the Pichula, it's safe, no infections. She loves to go to swimming. She loves to have a full bath. So because of that, she wants you to have Pichula. My needles don't hurt me. I, I like my fistula because that I can go and go swim. It's not something that every child goes through. But like a friend said to me once, you can always face your fears, which is, I think was very important to me. And it took quite a lot of time for me to get used to it, but I think now I'm happy that I went through it. And I find that it's better. I just love it, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Francis and Lindsay. That was excellent. I think uh, beautifully portrayed. We decided not, we won't have time for questions because we showed that video, but I think it was really important.